All right. And the reason I'm doing it, I, I did this is I, I put a narrow red border around this this map, and I only I did that just so that you could all tell whether you had cropped uh, cropped versions of my photos or not. Because I, in the past I've gotten myself very confused looking at programs, thinking, "Boy, that's a peculiar crop he's doing." Until I realized that I had my settings in a funny way. Okay, so uh, it looks anyway, perfect on my screen, Mike. Okay. Um, yeah, so in January 2018, uh, my wife Lee and I uh, took a short whirlwind birding trip, birding and photography trip to South Korea. Uh, and we hired Niall Moores, who is one of the foremost birders, maybe the foremost birder in, in South Korea, to be our guide. And we also invited a, a friend of ours, for New York, a like minded friend from New York to join us. So there was the three of us and the guide. And we rented a medium-sized SUV to get around. It did everything by driving, no internal flights or anything. Um, you can see from the scale of miles that I put on this map that it's not a large country. But that's not to say that driving from one place to another is very fast, because there are, there are mountains and the, the highways are good, but they're not, they're not like I-5 or, you know. So we covered a lot of ground and we had to sort of plan our moves. We had, our, our itinerary was flexible. We had a, we knew what sites we wanted to visit, but as, as far as what order to do in, that was, that was up to the weather, which is rather volatile in Korea in the winter. Uh, there's cold, there's snow, there's blizzards and freezing rain and ice and uh, visibility problems and since we were going to take it uh, one or two boat trips uh, offshore we also had to worry about wind and and sea conditions and uh, so when we arrived at the airport in Incheon which is on the northwest coast of the country uh, we we thought we were going to be checking into a hotel near the airport for a, to catch up on our sleep and, and then hit the road the next morning. Uh, but our guide told us as soon as he saw us, the weather forecast is such that if you want to go out on a boat, we need to do it tomorrow or the next day. And that meant driving to the extreme northeast corner of the country uh, right after flying in. So in other words, in, in the dark <laughs> and checking in. So. We were, we were sleep deprived sort of right from the start. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the purpose of the trip, we had very specific birds that we were looking for uh, as, as birders often do and as photographers often do. Uh, these these uh, were long-billed merlet, and a solitary snipe, scaly-sided mergenser, hazel grouse, um, Siberian accentor, palaces, rosefinch, Baikal teal, relict gull, Chinese gray shrike, Venus throated parrotbill, Japanese waxwing, and, and various obscure types of gulls. Um, and we had success to at least to some degree with all of these things, except for the Japanese waxwing, which you have you, you need an eruption year for them, and this this year was not it. So that's the only one that we dipped on. Um, so, okay, on with the, the trip then. Uh, so we headed for, oh, oh, sorry, this is an intermediate map. I just wanted to show you, towards the end of the trip, we went to the DMZ, which is where the little red arrow on this map is pointing. So that squiggly green line there is the demilitarized zone. Uh, anyway, we'll get back to that. So. After driving through the night, we checked into a, uh, a Minshuku, or a, the equivalent of a Minshuku, and it was right on the coast. And it was very comfortable. It was, a, it was cold, of course, it was always cold at night. Uh, but this, it was a nice room that we had, heated floors and, and the things that you read about from Korea and Japan, where places where it's cold in the winter, they have these creature comforts. So we woke up at dawn and looked out the window, and this was the view that we had looking east over the Sea of Japan. 
So the, as you can see, the sun is about to come up and the all the lights that you can see dotting the horizon are squid fishing boats. Uh, and they go out fishing for squid at night because they're, they use the lights to attract the squid closer to the surface so they can be caught. So after uh, an early breakfast, we headed out. The, the boat trips were gonna have to wait until the afternoon because the squid fishermen needed time to come in and offload their catches, clean up their boats and all that. So, we, <clears throat> um, so in the morning then we went birding, we went uh, sea watching along the coast. We did a lot of telescope scanning, scanning for some of the birds we were gonna hope to see closer up later by boat, like the merlet and other alcids and gulls and uh, grebes, loons and whatnot. Uh, so from our from our vantage point, there was some sort of scrubby forest just up slope from us, and we there was we noticed a few small birds hopping around in there, and we looked over there, and one of the first birds that we saw was this Siberian accentor. Um, accentors are a uh, Eurasian family of birds. North America doesn't have any. Um, and it's it's one of the more striking ones, as you can see. So we were happy to get that one right off the bat. Uh, and then within minutes of that, here's the uh, Venus throated parrot bill. And by Venus, I mean wine colored, V I N O U S, not, not the planet. Uh, <clears throat> here tiny birds. This is an exclusively Asian family. Most of them are Chinese, but this one is more widespread. And they, they form little groups that go form tight groups that bounce around together like kind of like bush tits. And as you can see the bill is very thick and, and sort of parrot-like. And there were a few other things around. This is a female Eurasian siskin uh, feeding nearby to us and here are some some male Eurasian siskins. They're a little lot, lot flashier than our pine siskins. And any pretty common anywhere there's forest are coal tits. Coal tits have a really wide range found all the way all the way across Europe and Asia. So then we went down closer to the water along the coast and to, to look at gulls and things. And one thing we saw quickly were groups of Eurasian widgeon right on the, sort of on the, and flying back and forth over the breakers, uh, which our widgeons never do. And thought that was peculiar that they did, that we saw several of them doing this. So I don't think it was a one-off thing. So the gulls, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert gull person. Uh, my friend from New York is, and our guide is. So for me, this was a, an educational experience. Uh, this is a, a young Vega gull. And Vega gull is the Asian version of our herring gulls, and they're almost indistinguishable. In fact, to me, they, they really are indistinguishable, to be realistic. Uh, but the experts can tell them apart, and they actually they, they search their local gull flocks to find one of the other kinds that doesn't belong there. This is the same thing in flight. And here's a, an adult Vega gull in flight. Uh, conventional wisdom is that the eye color is one of the ways to tell Vega gull from American herring gull. Vega gull is supposed to have a darker eye rather than the pale yellow eye like ours have, but there are exceptions. So this is a Vega gull that has a pale yellow eye, so it's even harder to tell what it is. If, if, if this bird showed up in California with our local gull flocks, I would never ever pick it up, uh, but a real expert might. Uh, and here, the middle gull is another Vega gull, a second winter Vega gull, and the other two birds are slady-backed gulls. And of course, they're chasing after the lead bird that's that's found a cluster of uh, sandfish eggs. And here's a a, a non-breeding adult glaucous gull. 
who also has found a cluster of these eggs. It, se it seemed to be a common food source for the gulls. And there's the same bird. Now here's one of the, the really special gulls. This is a Taimir gull, T-A-I-M-Y-R, uh, which all breed on the Taimir Peninsula of northern, northern Russia uh, in a very small area. And it's a taxonomic mess because they don't know whether it's a hybrid, hybrid swarm or whether it's a, a full species or subspecies of its own. Officially, it doesn't have any taxonomic status at all right now, but that might change. This is a, the, the whiter bird on the left is, the, is a second winter time year gull. So time year gulls from their breeding grounds migrate east-ish, east-southeast-ish and wind up in uh, Korea, northeastern China, Korea, and, uh, and Japan. Okay, now back, back to more realistically identifiable gulls. This is a, a black-tailed gull which is abundant in Japan. And you can see it's got a broad, broad black tail band. It's, just, it's smaller than the previous gulls I was just showing you. Um, this is a Kamchatka gull, which is the local version of a mew gull. Um, mew gull consists, our mew gull that, that we're familiar with, consists of three subspecies. This is one of them, Kamchatkensis. Uh, and the one in Europe is uh, the nominate, the, what they call the common gull. And those three could all be split one day. And when they do, it'll be another identification nightmare for, for most birders. And then the bane of gulls on the beach is, is this peregrine. Um, if, if anyone watching is, is an expert on subspecies of Peregrines, I'd be interested in hearing from you because the location of this bird in Korea, it should be uh, Japonensis, but from what I can tell, it looks wrong for that. It looks more like Kalidas, which would be a relative rarity. But anyway, if, if any of you has, have any insight, I'd be interested in hearing from you afterwards. And it's standing on a gull, by the way, but I, I can't identify that gull either. So the, the boat trips, uh, we, did, we did two afternoon boat trips. We probably would have only done one if we had found the, what we were looking for on the first one, but we didn't. <clears throat> but in, a, in, in any case, both trips were enjoyable and both were productive for photography. So this is a winter plumaged Arctic loon. Arctic loon is very closely related to, related to our Pacific loon. Uh, in plumage, in breeding plumage, but in the winter, when the plumage doesn't help us much, you have to go by structure. And they, they look like somewhere in between a common gull, I mean, a common loon and a Pacific loon. There's one in flight. And here's a red-necked grebe in flight that I was, I was really happy to get because I have a peculiar interest in photographing grebes in flight, and I had not managed to redneck grebe before, so this was a, a bonus. Uh, several species of alcids there, uh, some of which we're familiar with. We have them here and others not. So this is a breeding plumage rhinoceros alcid. And a non-breeding, probably immature, uh, common myrrh. And this is one that we don't get. This is a spectacled guillemot. You can see the more or less spectacle-like marking on the face. Uh, in breeding plumage, it's all dark with that, with that white eye ring. Uh, but late on the 11th hour of the second trip, we found the bird we were most looking for. This is a long-billed merlet. It's, uh, it used to be considered the same species as our marbled merlet, and the identification is, differences are rather subtle, but uh, it's, it's quite uncommon and very local uh, breeds up on the, the Kurile Islands and thereabouts. 
And then in the winter it comes down to places like Korea and Northern Japan. And on, very, on, on rare occasion, one occurs in North America also. Okay, so after finishing up this area, uh, we took off the next morning uh, to the south and hit, hit a couple of uh, river mouths where we were looking for some miscellaneous things. And one of the things we were hoping for was Palliser's reed bunting, which is what this bird is. It's a, it's a rather unassuming bird. They're spectacular in breeding plumage. Uh, in the winter, it looks, you, know, you, you, might, you might think this is a Spizella sparrow. Uh, and this is another of the same species. Non-breeding male, this likely is. They're very tiny. And here's a, a larger species of bunting, Siberian meadow bunting. It's common in northern Japan all the way to Mongolia. And we saw a few gray capped greenfinches, formerly called oriental greenfinches. And we had this beautiful uh, male bullheaded shrike. When we when we walked back to our car, it was perched on this uh, stalk right next to the car where, where we parked. And the light, the sun was out. That's the most amazing thing. And, and here was a surprise treat while we were while we were looking at the palace's reed buntings. This uh, amur amur leopard cat came walking out of the brush on one side of the creek and walked over, a frozen creek obviously, and walked uh, walked across. Uh, it's a small, it's a wild, native wild cat, but it's about the size of a house cat. There's another view of it. So, uh, this is a Japanese wagtail. Uh, it's only found in Japan and Korea. Um, this was nearby to where we just were and at the, uh, another river mouth. Here's the Northern Lapwing making a flyby. And closer to the actual mouth of the river where there was more mud and water and the ocean was nearby, we, we saw uh, some smaller gulls and the one with the, the larger one with the red bill on the left is a common black-headed gull. The other one is a Saunders gull, which is a rather sought after bird of, of, of Asia. They, they, breed in, they breed in China and they winter in Korea and Japan and points south of there. And they're relatively scarce and local. There's the same two birds showing the upper side. The Saunders gull is a sub-adult hence the blotchiness on the upper wing. And in the same location, here's a great crested grebe. I've never seen one so close before. They're spectacularly colorful in breeding plumage, but in the winter they become monochrome. Okay, so from there we headed back to Incheon near the airport where there was, where there's a lot of tidal mudflats and our, our goal there was relict gull, and that's what this bird is. It does, on, the, on the face of it, it doesn't look like much. It doesn't look especially interesting, but it, it's rare. It's, a, it's obscure. It's little known. It nests mostly in very remote places like Mongolia and uh, northeastern China, even Kazakhstan, uh, but they're sparsely distributed, and you have to they have very specific habitat requirements. They don't even nest every year if the water levels aren't right. And Korea is probably the most reliable place to find them in the winter. So from there, we went to a suburban park and to look for some, some land birds and the main reason we went there was that local birders had recently discovered a Chinese nuthatch there, which is a rarity. 
in the country, and we had never seen one, so of course we went to try to see it, and this is it. Uh, no, it's not the greatest photo in the world. It's it's a small nut hatch, sort of like like a red breasted. And there were other birds there. This is a brown-eared bobo, which is a very common bird of the region. And uh, here's a female brambling. It's nice enough to perch with a come colorist background. There are a lot of species of tits in uh, Korea. This is a marsh tit. And this is a varied tit. That's the, that would be the most spe spectacularly plumaged uh, member of its family in that area. So from there, we were off again. Uh, and we were going to an area that had things like stellar sea eagles and cranes and geese, but the weather turned atrocious. It turned into a blizzard by the time we got there and we couldn't hardly see anything. Uh, but at some point there was a, a lull in the weather and we were scanning around with the knocks and one of us spotted this shrike in the distance and, and it turned out to be a Chinese gray shrike, which was one of the birds that we were hoping to see. But it was way out in the middle of an egg field and it's a mile, well, a mile. It was hundreds of yards away. Uh, but uh, there was a sort of a, I'll use the term track loosely, but there was a, something you could drive on <laughs> out into the middle of the uh, field and we managed to get over to it and waited, waited a while. It's a shy bird, but we just parked for quite a while and eventually the bird flew, to, flew over to us. Yeah. Okay, so from there we went to another river, uh, which had an area had an area famous for flocks of Baikal teal, really large flocks. By, by large, I mean uh, potentially a hundred thousand birds. You know, Baikal teal has a reputation of being a, a rare bird, uh, but it's really that it's very constant, it's, it's concentrated in specific places and it moves around. So you can go to the place where there were 100,000 Baikal teals three days ago and not see any. Uh, <clears throat> so we were driving around this big lake looking for them and not finding them. Uh, but a lot of places we stopped, there were these buntings feeding in the Phragmites or plants that look to me like Craig um, and So this is a yellow-throated bunting. And I, I sort of just sort of stopped even looking for the teal because these birds were so beautiful and photogenic. And it, I took way more photos of them than I'd like to admit. Uh, and there was just enough snow on the, on the perches to make them interesting. So farther along, the weather again started getting iffy, uh, but we pulled over into a place where our guide knew there were some mud flats where there might be some more Saunders gulls, and, and there were. And the snow didn't bother the gulls at all. They were happily feeding. Saunders gulls uh, hunt over mud flats, and, and their main prey is crabs. So eco ecologically, they're just like gull billed terns. They, they eat crabs almost exclusively. I discovered on this day that autofocus has great difficulty focusing on, on, in these conditions. <laughs> Sometimes the bird is obvious to you, but the, the camera has no clue. Uh, <clears throat> so I had a lot of autofocus. Out of so anyway, we left that area, tried to try to get out of the bad weather. Um, we're driving over towards the west coast now, the Yellow Sea coast. And 
we were heading for an area where we were going to look for oriental stork. Uh, and on the way, we passed this a little pond that had these two shorebirds in it. And we said, hey, they look those like dowagers, which is notable because dowagers are rare in Asia. We pulled over and they were, and they uh, they took off. And somehow my camera, I managed to focus on them. I don't know why. Uh, and, and you can see the right-hand bird is tagged. And our guide went online and looked it up and was able to find that they were tagged in uh, Chiba Prefecture, Japan. Chiba Prefecture is close to Tokyo. So pretty interesting. All right, another day, another drive, another day. Now we're, we're at the North River now, sort of smack in the middle of the country, not near any coast. And the big goal here is scaly-sided merganser, which is a rare duck. It breeds, they all breed in China, as far as I'm aware, and they winter mostly in China and also into Korea and, and as vagrants occasionally to other countries. So, it was a cold morning and we ran into a flock of passerines before we got to the actual Mergenser area. And this is a male brambling. And this is a Neumann's thrush, which is closely related to dusky thrush. And there's one in flight. And this is a, a hybrid between Neumann's and dusky thrush. Dusky thrush is very common in Japan in the winter. Neumann's is common in Korea in the winter. And that's another Neumann's dusky integrate in flight. And while we were waiting for other things to happen at this spot, we saw this Eastern buzzard flying around on the other side of the road. And he was soon noticed by some magpies. Uh, these are oriental magpies. They're, they've recently been split from the Eurasian magpie. And they went after it. The buzzard wasn't the slightest bit perturbed. Okay, so this is where we first had our first sighting of the river. Uh, it's, it, is, it was as cold as it looks it, like it was. <laughs> uh, and it was a, a sort of an intimidating thing when we saw this. Like, how are we going to find a Mergenser out in the middle of that? And if we do, how are we going to get any photos of it? <laughs> but eventually... We spent several hours out there looking for them. And this is a female scaly sided mergenser. We're, we're at a quite elevated viewpoint looking down on this bird. I think I mentioned be before these birds are extremely shy. They, they, they flush. If you get within 300 yards on foot down, down at their level, they will just take off and you won't see them again. But we were mainly up on, an, on a highway that was sort of halfway up a slope. And I, I guess they could see us. We could certainly see them look at us and get nervous and swim away a little bit, but they didn't panic or, and fly. So evidently we weren't as threatening a prospect being up there than we were, would have been down on the ground. And this is what the male looks like. Quite beautiful birds. And there's the pair. They're very alert right now. One of, the, one of us just moved and they, you know, they, the necks went up and... Uh, so anyway, that was a major success that day. Uh, see, so from here, we drove back up towards Seoul where the National Arboretum is located. And for birders, that location is mainly synonymous with solitary snipe. And that's the reason we were going there. And we got there, this was the coldest morning of the trip. 
it was minus 20 Celsius, which translates to, uh, well, it's something below zero Fahrenheit. Uh, and they like, uh, they like these streams, streams that haven't frozen over because of the water moving. I don't really, I don't, I don't know how they can find anything to eat in, in this sort of habitat, but they do. And you can, you can just see the cold. <laughs> it has frost, the bird has frost on its back and, and then pour all over the vegetation around it. In the Arboretum had a lot of little birds, uh, woodpeckers and tits and buntings and it had some very cooperative bullfinches. Bullf bullfinches are usually rather shy birds, but uh, they weren't here. And these are of a, a regional subspecies that doesn't isn't usually found far from here. Rosacea, Rosas Rosacea is the name of the race. This is a female. And uh, this is what the male looks like. It's a, it's a more, it's a more subtle color of red than the European races, and the the pink extends farther down than the far eastern form. Uh, here's one of the other, another species of tit, long-tailed tit, and they kept they kept flying in in and out of the pine needles and sort of perching on the ends of them and hanging on and picking picking at things. And we couldn't make out what they were doing, what they were feeding on. And finally, in, in one of our photos, we saw that they were picking tiny little white spheres in insect eggs that were glued onto the pine needles. Uh, another Another reason for going to the Arboretum is it's one of the best places to see Pallas's rose finch. Um, and this, this photo is two different photos glued together just to show you the, the females on the left and the males on the right. Uh, I glued the two photos together because neither one of them lent itself to a horizontal that I wanted to use for this program. So after we were finished with the Arboretum, we headed out to the next spot and on the way <clears throat> late late in the afternoon stopped at a place that our guide knew usually usually had a Eurasian eagle owl roosting so <clears throat> it took us a while to find it because we were scanning we were looking across a river at a distance of maybe 200 yards uh, took a lot of scanning to find this bird sitting in its crevice and uh, this for this photo, I had to use a 600 lens with a doubler, and 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 apply a large crop. <laughs> so. Okay, the next site that we went was the DMZ, um, and we we stood. We there was a, a temple on the edge of the uh, DMZ, and we climbed up. I don't know how many steps to get up to the this viewpoint where we could look out over it and we could see all the way, we could see North Korea. You know, it's, it's, um, <clears throat> but uh, the fact that this area is relatively undisturbed has made it uh, attractive for wintering cranes, a roosting site, because they're not disturbed there. Now, these, are, these are a few red-crowned cranes flying out of the out of the valley early in the morning, headed out to feed in agricultural fields nearby. And a couple of white naped cranes doing the same thing. Uh, the one on the, the, it's an adult above and a juvenile below. And a lot of geese in the area also, these are, these are white fronted geese, same as ours. Uh, there are also a lot of bean geese around tundra bean geese. There were also a lot of scenarios vultures in the area. I didn't take any photos because the, the situation just didn't, wasn't right. 
and as you can, the weather again, again started turning, it started snowing, but this uh, oriental magpie was flying past us. And another case where autofocus surprised me by working. And All right, so we were, we were in good shape at this point as far as seeing what we wanted to see, uh, except for Baikal Teal. So we turned around and went back to the Baikal Teal place where we were before and then we uh, The buntings were still around, uh, including some rustic buntings. This is a, a male rustic bunting. And yes, it's still cold. Things are still all frozen. And, and this is an olive-backed pipit, not, not a really bird you might expect to find in a, such a snowy cold place. They find food in the, in the leaf litter there. And here's an azure-winged magpie feeding on some frozen hanging leaves. Anyway, we finally found some Baikal teal, not, not exactly the flock of 100,000 that we had envisioned, but more like the flock of 100. <laughs> but still, that was, that was good enough. This was another photo, incidentally, taken with a 600 and a doubler, because the birds were not very close. Now, from here, we headed to another river mouth with the sought after bird being swan goose. And on the way, we went through a, a big mob of rooks. Uh, and this is a, a race, a, a local restricted race of rook, not the same kind that's found in uh, Europe and most of the rest of Asia. And these are some of the swan geese. To us, they're just barnyard geese, but they are a wild bird with a yeah, they're, they're not very numerous. You usually have to make a, an effort to find them. There's a spot-billed duck coming in for a landing. And a couple of little grebes. Oh, it's a common green shank that did me the favor of flying in and landing right below me. And here was a, another one of our sought after birds, long-billed plover. Sort of, sort of uncommon, quite local, range restricted, but I, I'd never seen them this well before. Okay, now on down, we're about halfway down the west coast of Korea now, on, a, on the edge of the Yellow Sea. And a lot of you may be aware of a giant reclamation project that Korea undertook about uh, probably 15 years ago. They started doing it. There was a, this was an area, it was a, it was a huge estuarine mudflat system that uh, was a, a major stopover for migrating shorebirds. Uh, including a lot of rare species of shorebirds, but huge numbers stopped here for refueling on their way to Siberia and other points. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the government and, and the private sector decided they were going to uh, use this land. They were going to cut off this, the sea. They, they built a seawall uh, 20 miles long to cut off the ocean and, and the tides from this. And then they covered over the mud flats with the uh, landfill or dirt, dirt, whatever they could cover it with. And their plan was to build an industrial city on this site. And it was a huge area. The area is, uh, was about two thirds the size of Seoul. So th this was gonna be a gigantic uh, project and uh, of course to any environmentalist or ecologist it was going to be a disaster for for these all these migrating shorebirds would no longer have this refueling stop that they've been using for 
centuries. Um, and there aren't really many, any, any, is there isn't anything else in the area that can substitute for it. So this has had a major impact on shorebird populations in some species. I mean, this is this is the this is what was formerly mudflats, and now it's uh, relatively barren. Now, still the occasional thing. This is a Korean water deer. Um, but these, are, I just wanted to show you. Uh, the, some of the shorebirds, at least the, the ones that were most adversely affected by this project, the, the upper left bird is a is spoonbill sandpiper, which most people are aware of. It's a very rare charismatic shorebird that nests in the uh, far northeast uh, Russia. Um, and they they used these mud flats in fairly large numbers, large numbers considering the number of spoonbill sandpipers there are in the world. Uh, and the bird to the right of him is a Nordman's greenshank, <clears throat> which sometimes used the mud flats, even though their breeding range was not. It, it doesn't make sense actually that they would go there, given that they nest on Sakhalin. But <clears throat> and lower left Asiatic dowager, they stop there, and then. Lower right is a great knot, which was a very common shorebird, but this, and it seemed like a large percentage of the great knot population used these mud flats in migration. And now the global population of them has declined dramatically. Um, so these are, these are some of the birds that uh, have been impacted the most by this project. One of the worst things about this project, incidentally, was that in the end, they found that they were not able to do with that with, with this new land what they wanted to do because there were there was severe water pollution problems, and the nature of the landfill was such that it was too unstable to build much on either. So nobody won in in this <laughs> endeavor. Uh, Anyway, now we're on our last day of the trip. And so we, we drove up to a suburban park fairly close to Incheon, fairly close to the airport. And our goal was to find hazel grouse. Um, and, you know, grouse, grouse are generally difficult. They're wary, they're well camouflaged, uh, they don't, make a lot of noise and hazel grouse are not flashy birds in any way. They don't have a dis they don't have a conspicuous display like a sage grouse or anything. They're a they're a forest bird. The, the, the most I would compare them with our somewhere in between a ruffed grouse and a spruce grouse if you want to fit it into a North American perspective. But anyway, there are other birds in this forest. There's a this is a white backed woodpecker. Uh, uh, luckily, though, it, it only took an hour or so of stepping around, uh, walking around on these trails, and uh, our guide heard the whistle of a hazel grouse, and we walked off trail into the forest very slowly and quietly, and found these birds, which luckily didn't panic and fly off like they might have. So we had this. This is a back view, and this is more of a side view. Beautiful birds. And so that was uh, that was the end of our trip. From then, from there, it was to the airport and and home. So.